Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Landon. And I'm Haley. This is Race Car Revival, and this is our next video. This is us going into an in-depth discussion of the history of JR51, so sit back and enjoy the video. All right, so we're gonna start from the very beginning before we even got the car. Landon, where did you first hear about the car? So the first time <clears throat> that I heard or saw about the car was on Facebook about a year ago, maybe two years. Um, a gentleman that I'm friends with had posted it uh, for sale for his friend. Uh, there was no pictures, a vague description, um, you know, someone claiming it was a race winning Mark Martin car. Kind of hard to believe. So I looked into it a little bit. Um, at the time, I didn't have very many contacts or very reliable sources to go off of. I was steered away from the car. Uh, and, you know, at that point, I didn't think anything else of it. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't sold, uh, the, the, I think the listing or the, the post got took down and then from then on I didn't think anything else about it until last year, uh, around this time, my friend Thomas Hensley, uh, he had went to look at the car because he had got word that somebody had an entire car for sale in North Carolina around Rockingham and they were trying to sell it. To him he just was going to look for it I think to get parts off of it, I think he wanted the brakes and some other parts off of it that it had because it was a complete roller. It just didn't have a motor or transmission in it. Well, he gets to the car and starts looking it over and meets the gentleman that owned it at the time, uh, which is named Todd Baxter. He's talking to Todd and Todd tells him the story. And Thomas immediately calls me because he knows I'm a huge Mark Martin fan and he knows that we had restored some other things to do with uh, Mark's older cars or the truck we had that was a, a Roush truck, but it wasn't. Uh, true Valvoline truck. We had just wrapped it to mimic the scheme that's actually on this car over here. So, long story short, Thomas met, uh, called me about it. He said, hey, this guy claims he's got this car. It, you know, it won a bunch of races in 98. Uh, and, you know, at the time, I still hadn't seen uh, the pictures of the car Thomas was looking at, so I didn't know which car he was referring to. He sends me the pictures, and by that point, I had seen photos of the car uh, and Immediately I told him, I was like, you know, from what I've been told, that's not real. It was only this, and uh, that was it. At the time, I was being told it was just a test car, and it was never raced or driven by Mark. Um, I tell Thomas that, but at, on the phone, I'm telling Thomas, you know, let me just text Mark Martin and ask him. Uh, since that, uh, since up to that point, since then, we had this car over here, and this is JR29, it's a complete Roush chassis. Uh, all the parts were still on it, almost similar to the JR51. Uh, the only difference was, is when this car was found, it was in this livery. It was in the Valvoline number no. 696 uh, paint scheme. Turns out that this car actually, from what I've been told, was never raced by Mark. Um, it was actually an original uh, 16 Ted Musgrave car. Roush took it after they retired the car, painted it up like the Valvoline 6, and presented it to NASCAR so they could use it as a display piece. Uh, from what I could tell, it was probably in a, a NASCAR cafe and used to, to be displayed there. Uh, those obviously went out of business, so someone bought the car years later, put it on Facebook, I found it, and that's how I ended up with it. So we were restoring that car, and that's when I got a hold of Mark, because he was seeing the progress of the car, he was interested in it, and it actually had one of his original seats in it. Well, when he saw that I was taking the seat out to put one in that I could fit in, he asked, hey, will you send me that seat? He got a hold of me, a hold of me privately, we talked, and I said, sure. So I sent him the seat, and that's kind of how me and him got in touch with each other. Okay, so fast forward back to when I'm on the phone with Thomas, about 51. I tell him, I say, look, I'm just going to call Mark, or I'm going to text him. I'll send him a picture of the dash tag, because at the time it still had it on there. And I said, if, he, if anyone would remember it, it would be Mark. Well, I'd get the picture from Thomas and send it to Mark. And it wasn't 15 minutes later, probably, Mark replies back and says, I remember that car. It was my favorite car at Roush, and I raced it a bunch. And I said, so you really remember racing it? He said, yes, a lot. So at that point, I dropped what I was doing. I called Thomas. I said, hey, if you're going to buy that car to part it out, I will buy it. And I said, I will buy it and restore it. I told Thomas what Mark told me. He was all, you know, he was obviously awesome uh, about that. He said that was fine. He wasn't going to buy it. So then that put me in touch with the owner, Todd Baxter, 
and become friends with him on Facebook. I uh, was talking with him. It took me a few weeks to get everything lined out to go get the car. Um, but we finally got everything sorted out and we left this time last year, which would have been the end of March, you know, early April. And we drove six hours to get the car. It was sitting right outside of Rockingham, North Carolina. So we picked the car up from Todd. We sat with him for a little while uh, at his house, just talking over what he had. And I didn't even realize this, but he actually had the original wheels for the car. Uh, they were put up in storage inside of his attic above his garage. So we got those wheels with the car, um, which was nice because I thought, you know, I was going to have to find wheels for the car that were accurate. Um, but mind you, at this time when we picked the car up, it's only, it just, it was in white primer and it had a big Ford decal on the hood, which we'll put a picture up of the car right here. Um, and that was basically the last thing that was done with it was it was tested at Atlanta in October or September of 1999. I've got the dates from Roush of when it tested with that body. Um, but that was the only known thing that I knew about the car at that point. That and the fact that Mark did race it and raced it a lot and he remembered it. Um, so we load the car up, leave, come back, get the car here, unload it, and we're looking over the car. And I've known from the past vehicles we've had, whether it be JR29, um, we had a Robert Yates Racing uh, COT chassis that had a Ford Fusion body on it. All these race cars are etched. Every part on them is etched either with a date and the chassis number tag um, or at least a car name or something. Normally everything's etched. So we start looking over the whole car. First thing we notice are the brake calipers on the car. You clean the brake calipers off and they're etched and I think I have a picture of this we'll put it up here as well. They're etched uh, you know, with a date that they were rebuilt, I think it was December of 98, they were rebuilt last. And then the date below that is it says Las Vegas. And I think it says 3799. But it's the 1999 Las Vegas race, not the 98 race. Well, immediately I think, well, if this car was ran just as a test car, it wouldn't have a date from another racetrack like that on it. Um, still, I wasn't sold on it. And I started looking over the car some more, started finding more things that were etched and dated and marked. And that's where, you know, it kind of led me, led me back to what Todd told me. When we picked the car up, Todd did mention he knew every race that this car won. He just had no paperwork of it. He didn't have anything to prove it. And the fact that it was sitting with a 2000 Taurus body and primer didn't really help anybody either. So his story was the car raced in 98 and 99 but it raced and won four races in 98. it won las vegas texas california and michigan and he told me the story every race it won all the history it had and that would lead me to you know ask like anyone well how do you know this and who told you this so todd has been an avid nascar collector for most of his life at least his later adult life from what I can tell. He has a huge collection there at his house, um, mainly sheet metal. Um, but he was looking on Craigslist one day after he bought the car. Mind you, he bought it back in mid 2000s, I think is what he told me, 2008, 2010, somewhere around there. So Craigslist was still kind of big. He was looking on there for sheet metal. Well, he came across a full side for one of these cars. It was a Valvoline number six, 98 side. Well, he called the guy. Turns out the guy that owned the side worked at Roush. Um, he was one of the body hangers. So, you know, they got talking on the phone and Todd told him, he said, well, you know, I've got the car that that side come off of. And that guy said, well, what car do you have? And he told him, he said, I got chassis 51. The guy on the phone told him, he said, there's no way you have chassis 51. That was a great car. No one would have got rid of it. He said, well, I have it and it's here. Well, on the phone, he went over some stuff with Todd about the car and Todd found all those things and he confirmed that was the car. Well, then that's when he told him. He said, that's, he said I can't believe you have that car. We won uh, all these races with it. And he told him what races it won. And that guy told him, he said, I'll never forget that car because when we flew into Vegas, you know, it's chassis 51. And when you go into Vegas, you think of Area 51, you're out there in that way. So apparently he, you know, he made those two connections there. And he, he said he would never forget the chassis 51 because of Area 51 out there near Las Vegas. So he told me that story and I was like, well, that's a great story, but there's no way to prove it. And I believed everything he said up to that point. And I told Todd when I picked the car up, I showed him what Mark had said. I said, you know, this is what Mark told me. He does remember the car and all the, you know, racing it and all this. And uh, 
So back back to where we were when we got the car here, looking over all these parts. Well, when Todd told me that story that it won at Vegas in 98, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if it was that good of a car, they would bring it back the following year, more than likely. So that's where I got the connection on the calipers because it says Las Vegas 3799. So the first thing I think of is, okay, if this car was as good as they said it was, they would definitely at least bring it back to Vegas the following year, which they did. Come to find out, they did race it again in Vegas at 99. So we start looking over all the parts and start cleaning the car. And mind you, it's still in just white primer. Um, the next thing we do is pull the windows out of it, pull the front and rear window, the side windows. And when I pull the windshield out of the car, they normally, they bolt them in with tabs and then they'll urethane around the windshield to secure it in. When I pulled the tabs loose and popped the urethane, the urethane pulled the paint from inside the uh, window seal. That revealed the dark blue Valvoline paint that you see on the, the roof, the B pillar and the A pillar and down the side. And it's all through the, win the, the window track for the windshield. It was all there um, when, that, when that car was found. And I think we may have pictures of that. We'll post it on here too if we have them. So that leads me to believe, okay, if it was just a test car, it would have never had blood, uh, Valvoline dark blue paint on it. So I'm thinking, wow, that's amazing. Look some more where the window net hooks into the, uh, the roll bar at the top. There's a little hook on the window net that goes into a tab with a hole. Well, you can see where that window net had been in and out of that hole many, many times, and there's dark blue Valvoline paint there. Well, funny story, when you rewatch all the old videos from 98 of where this car supposedly ran, JR51 was the only car that I could ever see um, that had the dark blue Valvoline paint, and it came all the way down from the roof rail and partially onto that upper roll bar where the windshield or where the window net bolts into it. The rest of the cars, they just painted them all the way to the top white. So you would have the, the seam of the roof rail, or the roof, I'm sorry, the roof line would come down and then the bar that the window net sits up to would meet. And then from that point down, the bar would be painted that off white color. Well, JR51, they brought the blue down onto that bar. So the tab was dark blue. So I thought, okay, well that's kind of convincing too. Not to say that any of the other cars he ran that year didn't have it, but all the ones I saw pictures and videos of didn't. So then I got really thinking and intrigued about the car and I got a hold of Mark again to talk to him. And he was kind of vague, couldn't really remember you know, what cars won that race yet. He just, he was trying having trouble figuring it out. Mind you, it's been 24 or 25 years. He hasn't seen the car since 99. You know, he's done a lot since then, so it's it's understandable that he wouldn't, he remembered the car, but he, it's understandable he didn't remember the exact races it, it ran at the time. So then from that point on, we were in like super hyper fast mode to figure out 100% this car's history. And I started watching all the old races that it apparently won, and there's good in-car videos of that, that of the car racing. Unfortunately, there's only one race where you can partially see the dash tag, and it does, you can see a one, like it's clear as day. And then as it scrolls over, you can kind of see the, the outer right edge of the 51, or of the, the five and 51. Um, but there's other obvious signs in the car that give it away for being that car. Um, <clears throat> placements of bolts down the pillars, which some people think that's stupid, whatever, they can think that. Um, another big giveaway for this car was the filler panels that go up the A-posts inside the car that connect the side of the body to the roll bars. Where they offset the bodies, you know, one side will be different from the other. Well, this car, you can look at the videos and pictures of it racing in 98, and all the races that this, would have, that this car would have ran you can match the holes on the uh, filler panels. Because on the driver's side, the very the lower end, there's no holes. So you count them from the roof down, There's you know they pop holes in them to help save weight. And uh, down at the bottom, they didn't drill it the rest of the way. Why, I'm not sure. They look like they got a like, half inch diameter holes in them. There's a section there missing the hole, it's just solid. And then the right side is unique as well on its own, the way that the filler panels put in and drilled out. Um, the other cars that he ran in 98 that I could see, none of them match that. None of them were the exact same. So we get to that point, and I'm thinking, okay, this, just what we've got now, that's a lot of, uh, you know, good detail and reasoning to believe what car it is. I then go and contact someone at Roush that 
may have worked there back in 98. Turns out that he did, and he helped me from that point on getting a hold of uh, former crew members. He remembered their names, um, and I started contacting uh, the old crew members and guys that worked at Roush in 98, 99, and I contacted each of them and presented the car, just sent them a picture of the dash tag, and I said, hey, I first asked them, I said, hey, just wondering if you worked at Roush. They would, you know, they would always be polite and say, yeah. And I would tell them, I've got a car here that I think Mark raced in 98, 99. Do you remember it? And then I would send them a picture of the dash tag. And then that's when they would ramble out exactly what the car was. And every single person I asked, they had the same story and remembered every race that it ran and won. And I think we talked to 14 people, 14, whether they were crew members on the pit crew and obviously back then, you know, you're on the pit crew, you did almost, you did multiple jobs. So a lot of them worked at the, at the shop too, but there was also more people who just worked at the shop. I talked to them as well. And every single one of them had the same story, remembered the car and confirmed, you know, the races at one. I do want to back up a little bit because this is a, a, a big part. When we brought the car home, I remember taking the seat cover off and this will come into play later in the video. And there's a big 51 on the back in like black Sharpie, uh, just says 51. Mm -hmm. Also another thing that I think you forgot to mention was the roll bar pad um, <clears throat> is the same from 98, correct? Oh, the, the one with the decal. The big brother, big sister, yeah. or whatever it says. Yeah, so that was actually in the car. That's a good point, I totally forgot about that. That was another huge giveaway. Um, you know, you think about it, well, if it was only a test car and never raced, why would they have sponsorship decals inside the car where an in-car camera would pick up? Um, so that roll bar pad that's on the, uh, the center bar going up to the roof, uh, to the right of the driver, um, it says big brothers, big sisters, which was a big deal back in the day. I think Mark ended up telling me after we restored the car, he ended up telling me that I think that was a deal that he did through Valvoline, um, something that he supported. Well, you watch the in-car footage from the 99 Vegas race. That sticker is in the exact same spot. The zip ties are still there. Everything is identical. Where the zip ties are, how the decals, the decals laid out, everything. And we've got a picture of that as well. We'll show it here. Um, so yeah, that was a dead giveaway too, uh, prior to us actually contacting the guys that built and worked on the car back then. Okay, so go into more detail about the crew members that you talked to. What were their roles, names, anything, any information that you can give us? Yeah, uh, I don't remember who I contacted first. Um, I do know that a friend of mine, John Armbruster, He's the one that's helped me a lot with the car. He still works at Roush now, but he was he was an employee back then. I think he started in 96 or 97. Um, he remembered the car, and uh, you know he actually did find paperwork on the car at Roush, uh, wind tunnel reports, which there should have been photos and things like that in the reports. Um, I don't know if when he found them if they were still there, but they were digitally um, transferred, I think is what he told me to the digital archives they had. So he found the car uh, based on the chassis number, the, the or the chassis tag, not the actual build chassis number from Ronnie Hopkins. Um, so he found it based on that. Uh, and we we, uh, we corresponded the dates of where it uh, went and tested or where, where it went to the wind tunnel. And a lot of them were very close to, you know, being where those races were in 98, 99. Um, still, that's not enough proof for a lot of people. I would always want something in writing. Um, so fast forward, I start talking to the crew members. Another one that I, I, you know, I remember and talked to still, his name is John Curley, and I think that's how you say his last name. He was a fabricator there, and he was one of the guys that remembered the most about the car, like fine, minute details. And I sent him the tag. He was floored that we had ha found the car. He knew immediately what races it won. Uh, he, you know, he. He told me about that. Um, he told me little details inside the car, inside the uh, driver's compartment, things that he had put on, um, little things that they would change throughout the year. Another thing that I asked him that I was curious about is if you watch the videos from 98, the, uh, the bar that runs down the center of the windshield in these cars, which I don't think you can see it in this view, but there's a bar that runs down the center of them. It was mandated in 97, but prior to that, that bar wasn't there. And it connects the roof cage down to the, the uh, the middle bar there that sits behind the firewall. Uh, in 97, they mandated all cars had to have it, so obviously this was race in 98, so it had it. But when you watch it in 1998, the bar comes down off the roof and enters 
about the middle of the dash. It doesn't run all the way down uh, to the end of the windshield. Well, now the car has one that runs all the way down the windshield. Like, it goes all the way to the very end of it, and it's real tied up against the window. Well, I asked him, I said, well, that's the only thing that kind of throws me off, you know, on the car now is that wind, that bar is totally different. And I got in the car, looked under the dash, and you can see where it was a, like a, a secondary thought, like it was added after. You can still see where they welded it in. Um, they didn't even paint it. They just, they welded it in and left it bare where they welded under the dash. Um, and I asked him, I said, well, why would you do that? And he told me, he said, I remember doing that. He said, that was something we had to do uh, pretty quick before a race because NASCAR didn't like the way those bars were put in originally. They came right to the center of the dash. So that left, you know, a good six or eight inches um, where it wasn't up against the windshield. And they wanted those bars right up against the, the windshield, he said. He said they were very particular about that. So throughout the year, at the end of 98, they changed it to how it is now. And you can actually see that in the uh, in-car camera footage from the later races in 98 that this car ran. The bar went from being in the, the center of the dash, dropping down right into the center, and then it went from that to being straight out to the end of the windshield. Um, so he helped me figure that out because I was concerned, you know, well, that's a big part of the chassis. You wouldn't think that that would be any different now, but it makes sense knowing that, you know, NASCAR wanted it changed because of safety. All right, so you got verification from the team members and the crew members. Um, talk about the paperwork that you just received. Yeah, so recently, it's been almost a year since we've owned the car. Um, a friend of mine, Brian Murphy, he actually is a huge Mark Martin fan as well. Back in the late 90s, he actually entered a raffle. Uh, it was a nationwide deal uh, to win one of Mark's race-used cars from 96. Uh, it was chassis JR48. Um, he actually ended up winning that car. When he won the car, they put him... Uh, on the Valvoline uh, press release list. So he got all the, the newsletters and press releases from all the races and things that Valvoline sent out. Well, he has this stuff stockpiled in his house, um, put up, because he's kept it over all the years. And he told me back when I found the car, you know, he said, I'm pretty sure I've got papers somewhere talking about that chassis. Uh, I didn't think anything of it. You know, we were kind of too busy getting the car ready and whatnot. Well. Just the other day, it was actually a year or 25 years to the day when Mark actually won the race in Vegas. Uh, Brian sent me pictures of the documents that he found. They were uh, a newsletter that was sent out from Valvoline, a press release talking about the car when it ran at the Brickyard in 1998. It had a special paint scheme. It was painted gold <clears throat> and it had a Sinpower sponsorship down the rear quarters instead of Valvoline. Uh, Sinpower was a a line product that Valvoline came out with back then and it was promoting uh, that product at that race but the uh, documents go in depth as to the chassis it refers to the car as JR51 and then it also mentions the races that it had ran and won uh, prior to the Brickyard in 98 which were all four races that it won uh, Las Vegas, Texas, California and Michigan we'll put in a, uh, a picture of both documents here now so you can see both of them uh, they're very interesting and really cool to see. Uh, they're from 1998. I've talked to one of the guys that actually worked with Valvoline back then. Uh, he's on the top of that letterhead. Uh, he's at the very. He's the last person that's listed. Sent him some pictures of them. He remembers the car um, and he remembers the documents as well. So they've been verified to be real, and uh, it's really nice to have them. We're gonna get them framed up and have them hung up with the car. So you figured out which races it raced at, which races it won. How did you figure out who you wanted to help you restore your car as far as fab work? Because it did have the wrong nose on it, uh, paint and decals. How did you get in touch with those guys? Yeah, so once we figured out that it was a car that ran in 98, 99, with it having the 2000 body or 2000 Taurus body on it, you can't, you know, I was concerned. I was like, well, great, we're going to have to redo the whole body. Come to find out, um, the only thing that changed on a 2000 Taurus from a 98, 99 is the hood, front and rear bumper cover, and then the rear window area, which we'll put some pictures up here of uh, the car during the fabrication process. Uh, I got a hold of a guy named Ronnie Hoover, again, because of my friend Thomas Hensley. Uh, he was having a uh, Pontiac Grand Prix built. He was actually having an entire body put on a chassis. Uh, he's building a, a tribute car. Uh, to one of his family's team's uh, car. It was a 63 um, Nescafe Bush car. So he's building the car 
to uh, honor and uh, be a tribute to that. So I get a hold of Thomas. I'm saying, hey, who's building that body? Because that looks awesome. And they're, you know, they were doing everything the right way. They obviously know what they were doing. It was put on a surface plate, and everything was done right. He gave me Ronnie's contact info, and I call Ronnie, tell him what we're doing, you know, what the car is, the history, and uh, he's like, well, yeah, uh, I would love to do it. He was very into it. And at that time, we didn't have a deadline, so I didn't care. I just wanted it done right. And I told him, I said, you know, when you get done with uh, Hensley's car, if you've got room, we'll bring it down and you can start working on it. He said, okay, that's fine. Uh, Ronnie also does all the uh, repair work for Jeremy Clements racing in the Xfinity Series. So he does that, and if he's doing a side job, like whether it be my car or Thomas's car or anyone else's, uh, that takes precedent over our car. So that could put him further behind on a project if Jeremy has an issue and needs a car repaired quickly. Um, we're to that point now in the hit or in the restoration process. We want to get it and take it to Ronnie and have him do the metal fab work. Cause he, he explained to me, you know, the only thing that changed on those cars were front bumper cover, rear bumper cover, the hood and the rear window area. So the greenhouse really would be the same. The sides are the same. The quarter windows are the same. Uh, the rear quarter area is the same. A lot of it stays on the car. And I wanted the greenhouse to stay on this chassis because of the fact that it had that dark blue Valvoline paint all over it. It's original to the car. Um, so we're preparing the car, cleaning it, pulling the windows out, doing all that to take it to Ronnie. Well, that's when Mark Martin calls me and starts talking to me about him being honored in Las Vegas. Um, back in October of 2022, he was the first inductee into their... Uh, into their track, I guess you'd call it a track hall of fame, their legends program. Um, and he called me, he said, you know, it'd be awesome. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna honor me out there for the weekend, but I would love to have the car that won that race. He said, because I'm being honored for winning the very first cup race and it was in this car. Uh, you know, cause to that point we had done talk to everybody and they confirmed that it was that car. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell them they're wrong, he also agreed that that would be the car um, after talking to Jimmy Finnig and uh, I think he may have talked to a few other people from back in the day too as well. Um, but when 14 people tell you the same thing and these 14 people really don't stay in touch with each other anymore and they're not conversing about what I'm telling them together, it's hard to not believe them when they all have the same story but none of them are together with each other. Um, so at that point, that's what we're going off of. Mark's word and the former crew members and the fabricator guys at the shop, and Jimmy Finnig, which was Mark's crew chief. So Mark's like, hey, when could we have that, when do you think you could have that car done? And I said, well, I'm waiting on the fab guy to give me a date. So from the day that basically we dropped it off to Ronnie, we had six months to get the car completely transformed from a 2000 style Taurus to a 98 uh, Taurus. So that includes Ronnie doing his fab work running into any kind of problems that he had, which we were hoping that we could actually use the, the fenders that were on the body and just swap the hood and the nose. Well, that wasn't the case. This hood is, I think, narrower or wider than the 2000 hood. So Ronnie actually had to cut everything from uh, the windshield forward off the car uh, in terms of the body. The chassis was never modified, but the body, he had to redo the fenders and on both sides and all the way down to the nose. So he re-English wheeled all that, so that's all new. And he matched the pictures and videos that we had of the car on track in 98 because of the offset of the body. It was a intermediate car, so it had a bunch of skew in the body. I mean, nothing like they did you know, in the mid 2000s, but at the time it was pretty aggressive. So the left front fender's a lot bigger, fatter. Uh, the left front of the nose is, or in, on the hood is pushed down to the, in the corner. Um, the roof line, you can see the roof is, you know, all twisted. So he had to match all that and he did a great job. But we had six months for him to do all that work, then for it to get body work and paint, then get decals, then come back here, get the motor and transmission put in it, get it running right, and then have it ready for them to pick it up and take it to Vegas in October. Which... I was going to ask, so how long did it take, from the time that you dropped it off with Ronnie... I remember specifically watching Xfinity races just to make sure that Jeremy Clements didn't wreck because I was like, we have a, a deadline now and I don't want him to wreck because 
you know, if he wrecked, right. Ronnie had to do the fab work on his car first. You know, that was priority, obviously. Yeah, and so, Jeremy actually didn't. I don't think he ever wrecked. He maybe had like a minor, a minor issue that Ronnie had to repair, but it only took Ronnie a couple of days. I don't, you know, I know Jeremy didn't know about it, and I know Jeremy wouldn't no. care. I mean, he probably would care. I'm not saying he's a bad dude, but it's just funny <laughs> that that worked out the way it did. So, from the time you dropped it off with Ronnie, it was like a, a month, maybe? If that, three weeks? How long? How long? I know he had over, I know he had, and I could be wrong, and if Ronnie, you watch this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I swear he told me he had over 70 hours in the car. Yeah. And, you know... He did it perfect, everything. And he built the windows for the car, too. So we redid every window in the car, front and rear, side, all of them. And he cut them all and did it perfect. I mean, there's nothing that he did that I would have said, you know what, this is wrong, you need to redo it. Uh, he's very, for him to be so particular about his work, he's super, super friendly and nice. Like, a lot of people who are really particular and, you know, specific, they don't really... Sometimes they don't come off as nice people, no. but Ronnie is like super, so nice. super cool. Super nice. Yeah. That, that moves us to, I guess, the paint work. Ronnie gets done with the car. It's ready for paint and body work. And then that, that moves me to the next guy, which is Brian Cram. And luckily all these people live within, you know, a good 30 or 40 minutes of each other in North Carolina. Uh, when we dropped the car off, I left my enclosed trailer over there and they were all nice enough to move the car around as it needed to be. So from Ronnie's to Brian's, and then after, of course, Brian got done with it, it got took to Comp Cow. They were all, you know, okay with me leaving the trailer at places, then moving it, because we live four hours away from Charlotte. I didn't want to have to drive back and forth four or five times to move the car. So Brian Cram actually used to work, or maybe still does off and on, for the garage shop in Denver. That's where I heard his name from because Aaron and the guys at the garage shop did uh, some work for the two car we had. So I get a hold of Brian and I ask him, I'm like, hey, I've got this car. You know, it's kind of uh, on a deadline. We need it done in a certain amount of time. Would you be interested? And of course, he was just as nice as Ronnie. Super open about it. He would love to do it. Great paint and body guy. So he gets the car and knocks the paint and body out extremely quick. Um, and it's base coat, clear coat. It's a high quality paint. We didn't cheap out on nothing. He didn't rush the job. There's no waves or anything in the body work. You can't tell, you know, anything was rushed or anything like that. He did an amazing job. So I want to stop you right there because I want people to know, a lot of people don't know this, and this was kind of a, a frequently asked question. Um, is the whole car, so talk about the paint. So is it, like one, just talk about that. Yeah, so the only thing that's actually paint on the car is the white and then the dark blue. Um, at that point in time in NASCAR, a lot of teams were starting to get more, you know, decal oriented and were really trying to, I don't know if they were trying to move towards full wraps. I don't think they were at the time. I don't think the technology and the wraps and the vinyl was good enough to do a whole car. Um, but this is a, a half wrap that goes down the door. So the dark blue comes all the way up to my shoulder here, basically on the side, and goes all the way down to the corner of the, the front wheel opening. The half wrap starts right here at my corner, or at this corner behind me, and runs all the way back to the back where the Valvoline starts. And everything between that is one full sheet of vinyl. And that's how the real cars were done in 98, 99. And uh, it's a lot, I don't know, in my eyes it would be easier to do it that way because this car, which was from a uh, race in 90, from 94 to 96, um, that Valvoline paint scheme is all paint. Not the, not the you know, conting uh, contingency decals and, you know, the Valvoline, but the paint, the blue and the white and the dark blue are all paint. None of that's decals. And that's how that car really would have been done. So in my eyes, it's easier to do it this way, maybe a quicker turnaround time. That's why they changed it. They wanted to you know, that design on the side of this car with the flying V's going up the side, you wouldn't want to do that in paint. It would take forever. So I think it worked out easier for everybody. They paint the car two colors and then just lay that, that half wrap down the side of it. Is that a lot of so after paint and body, um, it went to a place called Comp Cal. Um, owner is Brian Whit Whitcamp. Yeah. Am I correct in saying that? Um, so tell us about the decal process. Yeah, so Brian... That's basically a, a no-brainer 
you know, before, you know, you got to kind of, I had to kind of figure out where to go for the, the fab work, uh, hunt down somebody basically. And then same for paint body in that area. That's good. And someone who could turn it around quick. Brian at Comp Cal is just, it's a no brainer. He's in that area. And if you want decals done on a race car, that's who you go to. Um, his eye for detail is extremely, extremely specific. He's very, um, he's very good at pointing out details and specifics of paint and body and decals on a car. So he was absolutely, you know, on board of doing it. Um, I had bugged him, I think last year about doing four or five other things that I thought about doing and never did. Um, and he was always super cool and responsive on Facebook with any ideas that I was kind of wanting. So the paint body gets done <clears throat> pretty quickly and uh, the car gets transported to Comp Cal. Uh, Brian gets the car out and I got to hit on this real quick. So he's the decal guy, you know, that's, that's his job. Brian takes the time to get the car out and washes the entire car because it's dirty, you know, the paint body shop's going to be nasty. Uh, not that Brian didn't clean it, but it's got dust and stuff. The trailer, my enclosed, you go down the road for more than an hour, it's going to get dust and dirt on it just because the inside of it is not finished. But Brian took the time to back the car outside of his shop, wash it all like it's his own, get it super, super clean and shiny, uh, you know, lets it air dry, and then he starts the process of the decals. Um, and that was the decals on these things, since we've done so many of them, is the scariest part to me because that's when you're going to make or break the car. Um, if they're not right, people are going to know it's not going to look right. And I'm just like, you know, Brian, Brian and Ronnie, <laughs> I'm specific to a T and I don't care if one rivet is not in the right spot, I get pissed off about it. And, uh, so Brian, all of them understood that. And they're basically the same way as I was. And, you know, I, I know I bugged all three of them probably more than I should have about things being right or looking the right way, but they did everything perfect. I mean, there's nothing I would change. So, and Brian at Comp Cal was no different. So he did the decals and uh, he's really into all the, I think he's really into the race cars. I think he's really, he really enjoys doing the job he does. And I think he enjoys seeing them when they're finished and being able to work on them. And when he was done with the car, it was, it was amazing. I had people, you know, thinking that that car had never been restored, that it was just found that way. It looked so realistic. Um, and so accurate to what the car would have been back in 98. The decals, the small decals, the half wrap down the door, the way the numbers are laid out, he did everything perfect. I didn't have to say, oh, you know, this is the wrong size, it needs to be bigger, or this needs to be here. Uh, he did it all perfectly the right way the first time. He also did the interior decals for the dashboard, like the sponsorship decals that you would see inside. Um, he did a decal for the headrest. Mark had Valvoline decals on his headrests in 98, so he, he redid that for me. Um, I mean, he just he nailed it. It was perfect. Uh, all three of them did an amazing job in the short time that, it, you know, that, that they had to do it. Uh, given the circumstances of the car, I think they understood uh, the importance of it and how quick we needed it done, and none of them you know, dropped the ball. They all did what they had to in, uh, in a short amount of time. And probably for a lot less than they should have. I think they could have probably charged me double what they did, but they didn't because they're just those kind of people. They're they're good ass people. So yeah. So just start there. I just want to say too that I want to give credit to everyone at CompCal. Um, I know there was a couple people, if not multiple people, that were involved in the decals. It wasn't just Brian, even though you know he was a big majority of it. But there was a few people that went and did the decals mm -hmm. too. And I think. <laughs> Brian Cram's son actually helped paint too. Yeah, his son. So Brian's son, um, back you know back up a little bit. Brian and his son used to do a lot of work at the garage shop. They would help out there. From what I could tell, they would go down there when they had free time. Uh, I think his son was more involved than uh, Brian was because he's always had a side business doing his own paint deal. Uh, I know he does a lot of farming too. I think so he stays busy a lot. Um, Brian actually painted the Talladega car that Aaron owns, which is a land speed car. Um, that car looks awesome. It's actually, it's went from two different colors. It was actually gray, I think before, like a primer gray, and then it, they painted it red. So I think Brian did both of those and it, it turned out awesome. That's the first time I'd seen Brian's work 
And then there was a few other cars I had seen from uh, mutual friends that Brian had worked on. But yeah, his son actually uh, his son actually came out a couple times to Brian's shop and helped him, uh, you know, lay primer down or probably sand on the car a little bit. And then he got to shoot. I think I think his son got to shoot the white and some of the dark blue. So that was really cool. Uh, something else to add real quick. The guy that owns the shop that Brian was shooting out of was actually one of the original painters from Roush. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. I forget that story all the time, but uh, he actually uh, owns the building and I think the shop that Brian sprays out of. They're good friends and uh, they work together a lot too. Um, he was dealing with some personal issues, I think, at the time, so he never, I don't think he ever got to come down and see the car, but I've spoke to him numerous times on the phone and he was, <clears throat> excuse me, he was one of the few people that remembered the car as well. So it's kind of funny how it come full circle right. in that way. <laughs> I just want to make sure we give credit where credit is due. So <coughs> name drop and throw people out there. So We got the car back uh, probably early to mid-September. I'm thinking late August, but I could be wrong. It was closer than I wanted it to be because you got to think, we still didn't have the motor and transmission put in the car. Um, I was fortunate enough to get the motor from Roush Yates Engines in North Carolina. It's a correct C3 uh, Cup Series engine. Uh, my friend John McKinney, who restored the uh, 28 Davy Allison car that everyone saw run at Talladega here, I guess last year, early, yeah, spring of last year. He's good friends with Doug, uh, Doug Yates out there, and uh, Jeff Clark, they, they're friends with John, so I think they contacted him about a C3 that they had that they wanted to sell. And fortunately, I needed one, so that worked out well for me. Um, that's what's in the car now. But we got the car back here. We had the motor and transmission here already. We had picked it up. And uh, a friend of mine that lives here in town, uh, his name's Tony Carter, he had actually did the paint and body work on this car and put the motor and transmission in it. Uh, he's really good with fab and stuff that isn't around, you know, like coming up with ideas, making it work, whatever. Uh, he had a few pictures of what the motor mount should look like for that car and he made them identical and they worked perfectly so this car the chassis for the motor is mounted the same way and i just took him the car after the paint body work and brought the motor and trans and he put them in <coughs> fabbed up the motor mounts uh, the trans mount was already in it so we just we that was easy it was already there uh, it took him maybe two days to do all that and then we went back and picked it up from him he also put the exhaust under the car, got it lined up and sitting where it should be for the boom tube on the exit uh, of the exhaust. Got the car back. One thing I forgot to mention, when we found the car, it's completely plumbed, okay? It has all the lines, the oil tank was in it, all the brakes are on it, all the brake lines are in it, the radiator was in it, it literally had everything. One thing though, and it had the wiring in it too, all the harnesses in it, the ignition boxes, somebody at some point clipped they cut the pigtails off the wiring harness that go to the ignition boxes. So there was just bare wire sitting in there. I don't know why they cut them. I don't know if someone at Roush did it or between them uh, getting rid of the car and it finding me if someone maybe ran up to the car while it was sitting somewhere and cut them and ran, I don't know. But we had to, we knew we had to tackle that. That was the biggest scare in my mind, you know, getting that done and making sure the wires were done right. So a guy I know from my work, he come out and we spent probably two days tracing wires and uh, owing them out because I knew what wires were what I just couldn't be inside the car on the passenger side where the pigtails go and then up at the dash switch and the switch panel on the dash and I you know that's a too long of a reach I can't ohm from one end to the other so he helped me with that <clears throat> we got all that sorted out uh, he put the new pins in and the pigtails on that I had ordered it's done just like it would have been at Roush it looks just like it would have everything's you know perfect it looks good and it worked that was the big thing um, so when we got the car back here from getting the motor and transmission put in, I think we had maybe three weeks before we had to be in Vegas. And we had to do that. That took two days, getting the wiring figured out. I uh, had to put the headers back on and the exhaust back under it because after we fabbed them and fit them up over at Tony's shop, I had him pull them back out so I could get them coated. Um, and then I would put them back in once the car got here. So I spent all day after I got off work at 7 a.m. I worked 12 hours and then come home and then spent from 7 a.m. until that night putting the headers back in, 
um, getting all the lines secured and in the car that weren't in the car. Uh, all the lines, we, we flushed all the lines, the fuel lines, the oil lines, everything that were in the car, we flushed out with, uh, with uh, cleaner and ran fluid through them. Uh, luckily, they were all sealed and ta or capped off when we found the car, so no dirt or debris got in them. Uh, I drained the oil tank. There was actually still oil in the tank from when it ran last. Uh, it had probably a quart and a half of oil left in it. Drained it, cleaned the tank out, and then we started getting all the lines hooked up and tightened where they need to be. Uh, we get to that point and we start putting, I think the first thing we do is put fuel in the fuel cell. The fuel cell wasn't in the car when we found it, um, but the gentleman that I bought it from, Todd, he had a fuel cell that he bought that was a road course fuel cell and it was out of a newer car. I pulled the cell apart, checked the bladder, checked the foam that's in it, everything was good. Uh, you know, so I was com confident that we could fill it with fuel and it not leak or have issues. And it did have the center fuel pickup in it like a road course cell would. So that's nice to know if we ever wanted to go out and road course race it or something. Um, got the fuel filled in it, checked for leaks. We pressurized the fuel system. So we ran uh, compressed air into the fuel cell off of a compressor through the overflow vent on the back. Just a little bit of air is all you need because uh, the dry brake seals up as well. Um, because it's a dry system, there's no fuel up here at the pump. I didn't want to sit here and crank the car for a half hour trying to get fuel to the pump, then from the pump up to the carburetor. So I put air to it, and it pushed the fuel from the cell up to the fuel pump. Mm -hmm. We had the line up here off, and she was holding it over a bucket, and as soon as fuel came out, we'd stop, and then we hooked it up to the fuel pump. That way, when you're cranking it, it doesn't take forever to build fuel pressure. So we did that, and then... We were getting close to firing it off, and we put oil in it. I think it held 18 quarts. They normally hold 18 quarts, 16, 15 to 18 quarts, depending on the size of the oil tank and how, what kind of pan is on, uh, what kind of oil pans on the engine. We fill it with oil, 18 quarts, uh, heat the oil, prime it with a drill on the oil pump. And at this point, it's like midnight, okay? And we live in a neighborhood. Um, Everybody's pretty calm around here, really doesn't care. We've had a bunch of these race cars and they're used to it. We get them out and run them up and down the road every now and again. But it's midnight during the week and uh, she comes. She had come home late that night and started helping me and we were ready to fire it, but it was midnight. So I was like, we'll just fire it tomorrow. No, she <laughs> wanted it done then. So we fired it off at midnight in the garage with the doors open. It's up on jack stands and it fired right. I mean, it took it a minute, uh, but once we got the uh, the fuel to the carburetor and everything sorted out, it fired right off and ran. So we were super happy with that. <clears throat> and at that point, like I said, this was probably mid-September, so we were getting close to having it done. Still haven't driven the car yet, though. You gotta keep that in mind. I haven't got in the car and driven it. I haven't, I know the brakes work, but I haven't driven it to see how good they stop, make sure nothing's clunking or coming loose. Um, so we did a nut and bolt check on it, I think a day or two after that. Um, and that's when we got it down off the jack stands and uh, tried to do our first test drive. So we got it down, backed it out, took it down the road, and I immediately knew something was wrong with it. Uh, I got on it coming back up the hill to our house and it's popping and backfiring at like 3000 RPM. Like it's hitting a rev limiter. And I looked down at the ignition boxes that's in the car and I didn't realize this until then, but the rev chips that they ran Mind you, that was in the car when it raced last, so I didn't mess with them. They had a 9200 and a 9400 RPM rev chip in the A and B box, so we're definitely not hitting that. Like, I thought maybe they had a small chip in it or something. Pull it back in, start diagnosing stuff, and I'm thinking, well, maybe we screwed something up on the ignition wiring. So I go back through it all again and triple check it now, and everything's right. Everything's getting connection. Everything's getting voltage like it should. The coils are good. We test them. Uh, at this time... A friend of mine comes over the next day and we start working on it again thinking maybe it's a carburetor issue maybe we don't have it jetted right maybe it's just it's not getting enough fuel whatever so we we try messing with the jetting compared to some of the other carburetors that we knew of that ran on other cars uh, that we had with similar motor uh, setups nothing helped it didn't matter which way we went with the jetting it didn't help anything uh, Fast forward, I had to work for a few days, so we didn't touch the car. Now we're we're at we're we're on the week of when the car needed to be picked up. Okay, we're in that week because the car had to be picked up 
<clears throat> a week or two weeks before Vegas. The guy, a friend of mine now, um, Daniel Vallejo, he was the one picking it up because he owns a transporting business, and they wanted it there. They wanted it there not only for the race weekend, but the NASCAR wanted it there at the uh, South Point Hotel and Casino to be displayed in the hotel lobby because that was the hotel and casino that was the primary sponsor for that cup race in October. So now not only do we have to have it ready for the race, but it needed to be ready a week before all that to get there in time. So we come back out, start working on it, and my friend comes back over. He's uh, super good with carburetors and engines. He drag races, he builds stuff. He's super, super smart. And we spend 12 hours on this car, nonstop. We don't stop to eat, we don't stop to do anything. If we have to use the bathroom, that's the only thing we stop to do. We couldn't figure it out to save our lives. We checked everything again, tried everything, and it wouldn't work. Every time we'd go out there and drive it, it would backfire and pop like crazy at 3,000 RPM. And uh, on top of that, it would sometimes not want to start. It would fight us starting like the timing was off. You would, <clears throat> you would try to adjust the timing. And when we did that, we noticed on the timing light, it, the, the timing uh, marker on the, the, uh, the front of the crank was moving. Like it wasn't staying steady. And neither him or I had ever seen that. So we didn't know what to think. Uh, we so luckily the distributor has marks where they've got it set on the timing and I knew that the, the motor had 32 degrees in it when I bought it <clears throat> And that's where these the c3, you know normally likes to be 28 to 32 degrees of timing So we put it back to where it was tried again. It doesn't do anything You can't adjust the timing at all on the distributor because if you move it just a hair it this thing It just it got so unhappy at one point it shot blue flames up the exhaust and I thought we had blown the motor up um we changed spark plugs, we changed them like four times, still couldn't get it. So literally 12 hours into this, it's getting dark outside because it's still uh, daylight savings time. Mm -hmm. Almost sunset, now it's me and Haley and my friend Dylan, who was the one helping me with the motor, and our friend down the street come up, his name is Richard. And they were all just, we were all kind of just hanging out and you know beating our heads against the wall. Well, I finally called my friend John McKinney, who was the one that got us the motor uh, through his connections over there at Roush. And, or at Roush Yates. And I'm like, man, have you ever heard of anything like this? And I, he didn't. He didn't have any idea. <clears throat> uh, you know, he kind of went through the, the same process that we did in his mind. You know, did you check this, this, and this? And we had. So he gives me a phone number to a guy. His name's Eddie Middleton, and I'm friends with him on Facebook. And he used to build these race engines for the teams back in the day. And I know he's very familiar with the C3. <clears throat> I call Eddie at 7 o'clock at night. It's dark almost dark I call him and I the, I tell him two things on the phone I'm like hey first I you know I tell him thank you for letting me call him so late and bother him and secondly I tell him I have a problem with this c3 I know the timing set here this is what I've done and this is what it's doing and the only two things I told him it was doing was when we put the timing light on the uh, front of the engine the timing marks were up and down like crazy I mean they were moving four or five inches like crazy amounts they shouldn't move like that and I told him how it was popping and backfiring at 3,000 RPM. And he, he only said, he said it right, he said, uh, he said your pickup wires are backwards off the distributor. He said, swap them around. He said, your problem will go away. That's all he said. And he was polite about it, but that's all he said. He said, call me back when you do that. So we get back over here. And mind you, <clears throat> when we did the wiring in the car for the ignition boxes, the only other thing that we had to do that I had totally forgot we did was swap the uh, connectors for the pickups on the distributor. So when we got the motor, the pickup plug, the, the plug on the wires off the, for the pickups on the distributor, because it's a, a dual pickup distributor, they were both female. Well, the harness side of the plugs for the car were female too. So I had to swap two of them, whether it be the harness side or the distributor side, and put a male plug. Well, I went color to color. So there was a purple wire coming off the distributor and a purple wire going into the harness. So I went, you know, purple to purple. Well, that's wrong. He was right. We swapped two of the wires on the pickup and it fired off. And I knew immediately when we started in here, it, it was right. You could tell it was running better. And uh, I sat here and held it to like, I ran it to eight grand. You know, I mean, the motor had heat in it. We'd been running it, so it wasn't gonna hurt it. And it went right up and it didn't pop or backfire. Took it out, <clears throat> took it down the street, ran it up the road. And it, I mean, it ran like, it ran great. And the next day is when they picked the car up to take it to Vegas. <clears throat> yeah, we had like, I think 12 hours to spare. 
from the, the last time you started it after you switched the wires until Danny, or his other name, Danny, mm -hmm. Daniel, he showed up in our driveway to pick up the car. So, Eddie Middleton, if you ever watch this video, you saved my bacon. <laughs> so, you want to talk about Vegas? Oh, uh, yeah, we can talk a little bit about it. So, we get the car out there. They display it at the South Point Hotel and Casino, which we can put pictures up here of it being displayed there. Um, they fly us out, pay for our stay. Uh, they put us up at the South Point Hotel, which was super awesome. I had never been to Vegas. My son had never been. Uh, ne had never been. My dad's never gone. So it was me and Haley, my son, and my dad. <clears throat> we all flew out there and then uh, stayed for five days, four days, and then flew back. And they covered all of it. Uh, paid for everything. Got us VIP passes for the races. Um, which I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you how good they treated us because they didn't have to do that. They could have just said, hey, we want the car and that's all, you know. Uh, the track president, Chris Powell, and then there was another gentleman there that, uh, I don't, I can't remember his job title, but David Stetzer, he helped a lot. And uh, just everybody that, that worked out there at the track were super friendly, super cool. Uh, when we actually moved it from the hotel and casino to the track, it was displayed out in front of the track for a day, then we moved it into the infield uh, garage experience area that they've got and that was Saturday the day before the cup race and then they were even nicer enough to m let us move the car over to the Xfinity garage and we had the entire Xfinity garage to ourself uh, I wanted to go over the car again and look it over and make sure nothing had came loose during the travel you know from here to Vegas and uh, get the car hot and warmed up and make sure everything's still good because I didn't want anything to happen out on track the next morning with Mark driving and then in front of everybody on TV and everything. So uh, <clears throat> everything went good and it ran great. Mark loved it. Um, he said everything was absolutely perfect on the car, uh, the body, the paint, the decals, the way it felt. He said that uh, it was the exact way he remembered it 24 years ago. And he talks a lot about he couldn't race now because he says there's a, a switch in his head that's been switched off. Um, you know, his reflexes probably don't, He's not, probably not as quick as he used to be maybe with his reflexes, but he said in that moment he felt like he could have sailed it off through the corner and that car would have held. He said it felt the exact same way he remembered it. So that was really, <clears throat> really cool and uh, something special. We got to spend a lot of time with him and his son Matt and his wife Arlene after the race at his motorhome. I think we spent probably two hours over there with them just hanging out and talking and telling stories. So it was something that we got to do that was special and uh you know i never thought in a million years that the guy that i grew up watching on tv uh rooting for in a race would be uh a close friend of mine now that i could call whenever and he would pick the phone up so it's funny that something like a car would bring people like you know bring people together in a way so what other opportunities has this car brought to us do you want to talk about that so um, the Vegas thing was, you know, huge. That was awesome. I don't think anything will probably top that. Um, we run with a group on Facebook every now and again and do some vintage stuff. We went to Rockingham, obviously, uh, and that was me running the car. You know, obviously I didn't want to run it to its potential because I don't want to wreck it or damage it because of how histor historically significant the car is. Um, I believe, you know, don't hold me to this, I believe we're going to be at the Darlington Throwback Weekend in the spring of this year. Uh, I've been in talks with the track president out there. Me and Mark and the track president have all kind of got together uh, because it's the 75th anniversary of NASCAR. They want the car out there. They know how important it is to Mark and to, uh, to me, and they want the car there to be displayed. I think there's a lot of cool stuff that's going to go on uh, at Darlington uh, this spring. So... Hopefully we can get all that sorted out and get the car out there. Um, there's three or four different things that we have kind of in the works, but nothing's been 100% confirmed yet. Um, you know, there's there's a little bit of talk too of doing something in North Wilkesboro as well. So uh, we just play it by ear and kind of go when we can. If I can get off work and go, then we'll go. So that's all we have right now, I think, like laid out for this year. Um, but we'd be willing to take it anywhere. Uh, if anybody's interested in having it displayed or wanting to see it somewhere and can get us somewhere, we'll definitely uh, entertain any ideas or offers because that's the whole reason of me redoing the car was one, yeah, I wanted the car uh, and I wanted to drive it and see what it was like, but 
I want everybody else to see it too. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many people have talked to me or messaged me and said, you know, I remember that car on the track back in the day. That brings back so many good memories. So I want people to be able to see it in person and relive whatever memory they may have. Uh, you know, back when NASCAR was probably at its peak, some would argue it's not. But uh, to me, I was five years old when this car was on track, so I remember it vaguely. But um, I remember how big the races were back then compared to now. So I, I believe, you know, everybody wants a little bit of the nostalgic uh, era of NASCAR. Look forward to our next video. Uh, we're going to be doing a Q&A about this car. Um, we can do one about that car too. Like I said, uh, the history on it is super, super vague. All I know is what I've been told. Uh, it's a great car. It's, it's in awesome shape. I mean, it was immaculate when I got it. Uh, the side had been a little damaged from where it had been transported around for years, but we fixed all that. Uh, but yeah, we can, we're can. we going to do a huge Q&A on this. I know some people have already asked questions and want them answered, so we'll try to tackle that. And uh, If you have questions, leave them in the comments. Yeah, if you have questions off this video, leave them in the comments, and then uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can. I think uh, the next video will drop probably in a week or so. And uh, yeah, just like and subscribe to the videos uh, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. The more subscribers we get, the more we can do. So... We want everybody to be able to, you know, come along with us and enjoy what we're doing. We're going to do more work on this car, though, over here to the left uh, of us. It's to the right of you all, but that car was actually sold. I don't own the car anymore. Uh, a friend of mine named Rob, uh, he lives in Florida. He bought the car last year so I could fund this one. Uh, long story short, his house was unfortunately pretty well demolished uh, during the hurricanes that come through Florida last year. So... Uh, he was nice enough to send us the car back up here uh, and let us store it for him while he's getting his house and things figured out. We're going to do some work on it uh, as we get time and you know we'll do what we can for him on the car. But uh, we'll definitely video that because unfortunately we did all this on this car and didn't video it, but we're going to start now. So we've got a lot planned that everybody can tag along and watch. All right. Well, thank you for watching.